a female police officer gunned down doing the job she loved. First thing I saw was the policewoman collapsing. She was hit, she fell down, the colleagues rushed to her. Named two men suspected of conspiracy to murder. Baghdadi and Matuk were seen on the first floor where the shooting took place. That placed them at the very heart of what's happened over the next few minutes. But will they ever face trial? They have been handpicked by Gaddafi. They have been indoctrinated by him. It is inconceivable for Gaddafi to give up two leaders like Matuk and Baghdadi. Twenty-six years ago, this picturesque central London square was the scene of a shocking act of terrorism. Yvonne Fletcher, a young female constable, was policing a demonstration outside the Libyan embassy here when a gunman opened fire from the building. PC Fletcher was shot in the back and fatally wounded. Her murder triggered a political and diplomatic storm which even today has her friends and family asking who killed her and why can't he be brought to justice? Tonight, for the first time, we can piece together the crucial events leading up to and following the murder of Yvonne Fletcher. We have acquired a confidential legal report sent to the Crown Prosecution Service that summarizes the key evidence, including pictures and biographies of key figures, diagrams and photographs, forensic evidence, but which, most critically, suggests who might be prosecuted for conspiring in this brutal murder. Yvonne Fletcher was described by her colleagues as a diamond of a girl. She joined the Metropolitan Police Force aged just 19. She was the shortest police officer in Britain and had been turned down by two other forces because of her lack of height. She was my best friend. Very bubbly, very sweet, very gentle, very small. Everybody used to know her. Um, she used to enjoy her work. People would come to the police station, believe it or not, and ask for her to do various jobs for them. So uh, she was very, very popular. This was one of the happiest times of her life. She was engaged to be married and had recently taken on extra responsibility at work by training new recruits. She had everything to look forward to. She was happy at work. She had just got engaged and she had such a bright future. On April the 17th, 1984, she was due to police a demonstration outside the Libyan Embassy in St. James's Square. In theory, it was a routine assignment. But unknown to her, two warring factions within Libyan politics were about to come face to face. A group of exiles were planning to protest outside the embassy about the regime of the Libyan leader, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. According to some experts on the country, he had developed a ruthless method of dealing with his opponents. He was uh, furious at the prospect that Libyans could be uh, demonstrating against the regime abroad, could be trying to uh, destabilize the regime and would be using safe havens in, in countries like the United Kingdom to try to demonstrate against some, some of the things that were happening in Libya. And he had a policy of, of trying to have these people eliminated. Alarmed by the prospect of such a high-profile show of dissent, Gaddafi's supporters in the embassy organized a counter-demonstration. This was the murky and sinister background as the protesters arrived in St. James's Square. It wasn't a very big demonstration, but some of these anti-Gaddafi students had come from as far as Manchester, their faces hidden to avoid identification by observers inside the bureau. On the coach that day was Juma El Gamati, 
Back then, he was one of the organizers, but today he's a businessman and writer on Libya. And this is Mohamed Maklouf, another organizer, but today he's a filmmaker. Booked out of the bus. It was a beautiful day, April. And the first thing was this beautiful smile from the policewoman, Yvonne Fletcher. She was greeting us, saying good morning, what a beautiful day. I'll never forget her, her, her face, she was smiling. We stood in the place assigned to us behind the barriers. We got our black cards out, and then we start chanting things like no to dictatorship Libya, yes to freedom, down with Gaddafi, down with the dictatorship, things like that. And then the, the pro-Gaddafi demonstrators as well start gathering on the other side. The two groups lined up opposite each other in the corner of St. James's Square, outside the Libyan embassy. Yvonne Fletcher was stationed just in front of the anti-Gaddafi protesters. I saw somebody opening a window on the first floor of the Libyan embassy, which was unusual because they didn't usually open the windows. There were two windows lifted up by about this much. I would say maybe about 20 inch, 15, 20 inch. And the, the shots rang out. First thing I saw was the policewoman collapsing. She was hit, she fell down. She rolled on the ground. Her, her colleagues rushed to her. It was awful. Eleven shots were fired from the embassy. Yvonne Fletcher was hit in the back. Yvonne was writhing around on the floor in pain. Um, myself and other officers crowded around her, and everybody else scattered. What seemed like a few minutes, we were left in St. James Square on our own outside the embassy with no one else there at all. It was quite frightening. Looking back on it, it was very frightening. I went down to her as she's on the, on the ground here. Um, I, I put my hands under her head and sort of cradled her and, and trying to help her. And the complete silence, the silence afterwards, th there was no noise whatsoever. As he tended to his friend, it dawned on John Murray that they were still in the firing line. Once I'd realized that shots had been fired, I thought, if they open up again, that's it. There'll be none of us left. We had to get her out of St. James' Square. We, you know, we, we couldn't do anything else, so we had to take her into Charles II Street. The injured took cover out of the line of fire. Bodies were now strewn across the street. Eleven Libyans had also been injured in the shooting. Yvonne Fletcher was bundled into an ambulance by her colleagues. We made our way to Westminster Hospital, and on the way to the hospital, Yvonne said to me, she said, John, she said, my, um, my stomach hurts. So I thought, well, I've, I've got to do something. And so I spoke to the ambulance man, and I got a pair of scissors, and the only thing I could think of doing was just cut a skirt. It seemed strange, but it, it seemed to relieve the sort of pressure that, that, she, that, that she had. So I cut her skirt, and I said to Yvonne in that ambulance, I said, Yvonne, he said, don't worry. You'll be OK, and we'll get whoever did this. Don't worry, we'll get them. Around an hour and a half after being shot in the back, 25-year-old Yvonne Fletcher died. One of the first things that I said to myself was, why her and not me? Why? Why Yvonne and not me? When she had anything to live for. But I just could not believe it. It didn't happen in London. It didn't happen at, at demonstrations. It never happened before. Police had decided to evacuate the whole area and to get the thousands of office workers near the bureau out as quickly as possible. Back in St. James's Square, armed police surrounded the embassy. In theory, the murderer was cornered. Police were ready to storm the building. What was stopping them? 
These people inside the building, as far as the police were concerned, had opened fire on one of their colleagues. The temptation to charge in there, all guns blazing, must have been huge, and somehow they held back, knowing that there were other wheels turning. Yvonne Fletcher was murdered as she supervised the demonstration outside the Libyan embassy. She was shot by a gunman firing from the first floor of the building behind me here. A tense standoff began between the police and the Libyans, and many police officers wanted to storm the building, believing the killer was still inside. No doubt about it, her killer was in that building. So why not storm the building and arrest those people? They, they were responsible for her murder. I mean, it stands to reason. But this was no ordinary building. It was an embassy. Any action against it would have to be sanctioned from the very top. With the Prime Minister abroad, the Home Secretary, Leon Britton, took command. I was conscious all the time of a tremendous responsibility, of course, yes. It was probably the greatest single uh, crisis-type responsibility uh, that I uh, had in my career as Home Secretary. One of his first calls was to send in the SAS. Expectations rose that the Libyan embassy would be attacked. Four years earlier, the SAS had successfully stormed the Iranian embassy, where 26 hostages were held by terrorists. Well, back in 1984, I was a member of the SAS. I was in uh, one of the squadrons there that was on standby with the counter-terrorist teams. We knew that uh, Yvonne Fletcher had been shot, and we knew that we were going to be called in. So basically, we were given the gypsies to say that, get prepared to move. But any room for manoeuvre was fast running out. 1,500 miles away in the Libyan capital, Tripoli, the British embassy was also put under siege. The first thing that actually happened in Libya that was sort of affected us and which we had to report to London was that sometime around two or three o'clock when we normally would have left the embassy and the staff would have gone home we found we couldn't we were prevented from from leaving the embassy and then we knew that you know there was a there was a, a crisis in Tripoli as well as a crisis in London if you like foremost in the British government's mind were not only the diplomats and staff in the embassy but also the thousands of Britons who worked in Libya they were uh, potential hostages. At that time, uh, Colonel Gaddafi was a completely unpredictable wild card, and he just didn't know what he was going to do. With weapons drawn on two continents, who would blink first? The SAS were now assessing how they might attack the embassy. We obviously had to disguise ourselves as, as, as coppers, basically, and that's what we did. We had to visually look at the front of the building. We had to see it, see what it was like. What was it made of? Were the windows reinforced with bars? Did they have security glass in? You know, stuff like that. But there was a further complication. Under international law, the police couldn't enter the embassy without the permission of the Libyans. It now became clear the siege was not going to be resolved quickly. A game of diplomatic cat and mouse was going to be played out over a number of days. With the siege now in its second day, the police are continuing their tactics of patiently waiting and talking to the Libyans inside the building. Just over 24 hours after the shooting of Yvonne Fletcher, and the Libyans weren't only in touch with the police, they were also looking to win the propaganda war. Do you have any message at all for uh, the British people? Well, what I could say was nothing to do with us, and we're innocent, that's all. This stance was reinforced by Colonel Gaddafi himself when he appeared on television the next day to goad Britain. Gaddafi's grandstanding was typical of his leadership. Since taking power in Libya in 1969, he had developed a brutal style of dictatorship. 
Gaddafi had only one way of dealing with opposition. There will be random imprisonment, there will be torture, there will be uh, uh, summary trials, there will be imprisonments for a long, long time. There will be no rights for those who are seen as uh, agitators and subversive and anti the regime. Within hours of Gaddafi's appearance on television, a raucous demonstration took place outside the British Embassy. The British ambassador attempted to pacify the crowd. In approved Foreign Office technique, we had conveyed a message through the police that if, if they wanted to deliver a, a letter to us, we were prepared to receive it. Uh, this is one of the ways of making sure that a demonstration, trying to make sure that a demonstration remains reasonable. So yes, sure enough, they did want to deliver a letter. A letter was produced and it was delivered through the door and it was a letter, a circular letter from the Libyan Foreign Ministry inviting all embassies in Tripoli on a picnic the following week. <laughs> this was passed over the heads of the crowd and pushed through a door open to, a, to such width, you know, um, and that's what we received. Outraged by Libya's bullying behavior and with both embassies still under siege, Britain broke off diplomatic ties with Libya. The break off of diplomatic relations comes less than 24 hours after Colonel Gaddafi warned that although talks were going well at that stage, the Libyans were very, very angry and he could not promise further protection outside the British embassy here. The move ratcheted up the tension between the two countries the ambassador's home in Tripoli now received some unwelcome news. There was a nasty moment when the Spanish ambassador rang up my wife and said, they'll burn you down, you know, they always do. But he was wrong. You know, we thought everything was going to work out fine, and it's really rather a disappointment. The Libyans were also angered by the ambassador's wife's enthusiasm to talk to the media. Eventually, they got fed up with my wife telephoning the press and they cut off the telephone to the house, but luckily a very nice uh, Nigerian butler, so-called, remembered that there was a, a separate telephone in the changing room at the swimming pool, um, which was locked, but they managed to break the lock off, and so they were able to use that telephone subsequently, and the Libyans weren't wise to it. In London, with the embassy still surrounded, frustration was mounting. In my view, they could have gone in perhaps much earlier using the SAS, got the people out and handed them over to the police for a normal murder investigation. Despite the intense public pressure to take decisive action, Britain blinked first in the confrontation. The climb down began when the Libyans inside the embassy were allowed to send home 18 bags. They were not searched before the van left under police escort from St. James's Square, bound for Heathrow Airport. Even though it was possible that the murder weapon was hidden inside one of these bags, international law meant the police had no right to search them. It was the first indication that international diplomacy would thwart the investigation. In a tit-for-tat agreement, the British ambassador's family left Tripoli. The day began as the embassy staff and families gathered outside the ambassador's home. 30 people left today, women and children first. The remaining 14 will go at the weekend, including the ambassador. Despite 10 days under siege, the ambassador's wife remained defiant to the end. in St. James's Square, the SAS was stood down, much to their disappointment. Yeah, I thought, fuck it. We should have gone in there and killed them. She just mopped it up. Maybe he left one, I don't know, for interrogation. Then, 11 days after the murder of Yvonne Fletcher, in a moment which horrified Britain, the Libyans walked out of the embassy. I couldn't believe that. I really couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I felt so let down. I was let down by the Metropolitan Police at that stage because they should have stormed that building 
We all thought that. All the people at the police station, all those on the front line, all said that. We all agreed. I felt that this is one of those occasions where you have to suppress personal feelings of outrage uh, because that's a, a natural human feeling which everybody was likely to have against the consideration of what really is in the national interest to do. As the Libyans headed home, no police officer was allowed to ask them what had happened on the day of the shooting. Just like the bags that could be holding the murder weapon, the diplomats were protected by international law. As the chanting, wailing and shouting continued, the crowd swarmed through the airport. Every one of them maintaining the St. James's Square shootings had nothing to do with them. Returning home, the Libyans were given a hero's welcome. Some reporters were able to get closer to them than any policeman or secret service agent. Did you hear gunshots? No, there were no gunshots at all. So what was the first you knew that someone had been shot? Yeah, on the telly. On television? You yes. did not know before you saw it on television? No, no. Who do you think fired the shot? I think in outside. Here. I think some people there. Were there some thing outside only. Were there any guns or explosives inside the bureau? No, no, we haven't. In contrast to the triumphant scenes in Libya, Salisbury Cathedral fell silent for Yvonne Fletcher's funeral. I was privileged enough to carry Yvonne's coffin at, uh, at Salisbury Cathedral. I have never seen so many people at a service in my life. The cathedral was packed, not by just police officers, not by just dignitaries, but by ordinary members of the public which proves how popular she was. For Yvonne Fletcher's family and friends, the service would mark the start of a long and painful battle for justice. And the investigation into her murder would remain shrouded in mystery for decades until a secret report came to light. The author of the report has obviously had access to a lot of information, witness statements, photographs. There's not a lot of doubt in uh, what his view is the report does seem to reach some fairly strong conclusions. Over the last 26 years, the Metropolitan Police have uncovered a vast amount of evidence relating to the murder of Yvonne Fletcher. In 2007, an international lawyer reviewed the material for the Crown Prosecution Service. He concluded there could be sufficient evidence to charge two Libyans with conspiracy to murder. We asked a former criminal barrister and now firearms expert to review the report. The author of the report has obviously had access to a lot of information. Witness statements, photographs, the reports of forensic scientists. So a lot of this has been brought together to make a fairly comprehensive document. The report raises significant questions about whether the authorities could have been better prepared. There were four warnings from the Libyan authorities about possible violence at the embassy. The first came in Tripoli, just over 12 hours before Yvonne Fletcher was shot, when the British ambassador was called to a meeting with Libyan officials. And they told me that uh, there was a demonstration planned for the following morning outside the Libyan office in London and that I was to get it stopped. And I said, you must be joking. Um, you have demonstrations outside my embassy from time to time. They're properly policed. I have no complaints. The same thing will happen in London. They said, you don't understand. This is different. This is, this is very important. We're giving you a really serious message. You must have it stopped. After the meeting, the ambassador immediately wrote a memo to be sent to the Foreign Office.
But the Foreign Office had also been given their own warnings when two Libyan diplomats, Muftafa Touri and Hanidas Litini, went to the Foreign Office in London to give a similar message to officials. Just to be sure that their message was received, they returned the following morning and repeated it. And according to the report, there is evidence that there were warnings of violence even on the morning of the shooting. An employee of the Metropolitan Police claims a Libyan, later revealed as Saleh Ibrahim Mabruk, tried to stop him putting out barriers right here in front of the embassy. At one point in their altercation, Mabruk allegedly told him, we have guns here today, there is going to be fighting, and we're not going to have responsibility for you or for the barriers. Mabruk was eventually arrested for his protests and was still in custody at the time of Yvonne Fletcher's murder. He denied any prior knowledge of the shooting, saying he thought the embassy was going to be attacked by a Palestinian group. But the inevitable question for those working alongside Yvonne Fletcher that day, why weren't we told? If those warnings have been heeded and action taken, if one would still be here today, there is no doubt about that whatsoever. I mean, the demonstration probably wouldn't have taken place. If it had been taken place, all different arrangements would have been put in hand, surely. If you're suggesting that there was any indication given to us, or to me, certainly, uh, that um, the Libyans were going to take violent action um, against the demonstrators, that's not the case. Don't forget that these people are pretty wild and they were quite capable of threatening all sorts of things to all sorts of people at all sorts of time. According to the report, the warnings could infer that the shooting was part of a carefully planned operation which had support from senior officials in the Libyan regime. When the embassy was searched after the siege, officers found an arsenal of weapons and ammunition. High levels of firearms discharge residue were also found around these two windows, suggesting that there were two gunmen. We've got two shooting positions, if you like, two windows that were next to each other, and you've got bullets that were found in different uh, areas. So all these things, in my view, would suggest that two guns were probably used. Using this information, officers then plotted the direction of the shooting. The location where they found the bullets in the square indicated that the two gunmen had aimed in different directions. There were two distinct areas in which the bullets were found. The first area was in front of the bureau and the second area was across the square. So it seems that somebody was aiming more or less downwards into the demonstrators and obviously towards uh, PC Fletcher. The three other bullets were recovered some distance away which suggests that that gun wasn't being pointed downwards, it was being pointed perhaps upwards, but certainly in a different angle. The confidential report prepared for the Crown Prosecution Service doesn't name any suspects as the gunman. But could more have been done at the time to identify the killer? Linda Kells was working in number three St. James's Square on the day of the murder. She thought she saw someone at the window of the embassy around five minutes before the shooting. The window was opened up by, um, he was sort of an Arab looking man, but he wasn't a terribly swarthy Arab looking. He, he had a light colour suit on, a moustache. Um, yeah, I would have recognised him at the time. We showed Linda Kells photographs of some of the Libyans who were inside the embassy on the day of the shooting. Inevitably, 26 years after the event, she's unable to recall precisely who she saw. I would say anyone of... Oh, so difficult, so long ago. Um, any one of these three... Do you think if you'd been shown those photographs nearer the time, you might have been more confident about who you saw? If I'd have seen them... At the time, I'm sure I would have been more confident about which one I saw, but not now. For legal reasons, we're not able to identify the men Linda Kells singled out. 
While the identity of the gunman remains a mystery, the report does name two Libyans who, it concludes, could be charged with conspiracy to murder. Both are identified as being key members of a revolutionary committee appointed by Colonel Gaddafi. Gaddafi sent a, a group of students under a student visa to come to the UK and study, but they were really top revolutionary committee members. But then when the order came to them, they moved down to London and they took over the embassy, and so they were running the show. It's not clear how many members were in the Revolutionary Committee, but two names were consistently mentioned by witnesses, Mohammed Matuk and Abdul Ghadir Baghdadi. One key eyewitness who must remain anonymous gives a detailed account of the roles they're alleged to have played on the 17th of April, 1984. If this witness is to be believed, his evidence is absolutely crucial. He puts Machuk and Baghdadi firmly in the picture. But to understand the significance of his account, you have to know the layout of the embassy. This police diagram illustrates the ground floor of the building. This was a public area where many typical functions of the embassy took place. But this is the first floor where forensic tests showed the shots were fired from. According to several regular visitors to the embassy, this was an exclusive area where access was controlled by the Revolutionary Committee. On the morning of the shooting, the eyewitness says Baghdadi and another man started to organize the pro-Gaddafi counter-demonstration. They addressed the students on the ground floor of the embassy. According to this eyewitness, at one point they told students where to stand to avoid being shot. They were also told to run away after the shooting had occurred. The eyewitness says he then saw Baghdadi and Matuk on the first floor of the embassy. Don't forget by now the embassy is in lockdown. They've turned away any non-Libyan nationals. And the first floor is a sealed area. And yet 45 minutes before the shooting took place, Baghdadi and Matuk were seen on the first floor where the shooting took place. That placed them at the very heart of what's happened over the next few minutes. Shortly after this, according to the eyewitness, Baghdadi and Matuk went downstairs and sent the pro-Gaddafi students outside to start the counter-demonstration. It's not known what Baghdadi and Matuk did once the demonstration began. Neither was in the building by the time it was surrounded by armed police after the shooting. Given the chaos that no doubt ensued after the shooting, people were shot, people would be panicking, they wouldn't know whether further shots were going to come, and clearly they'd be looking more out for their, their own safety than concerned about who else was running around. The police caught up with Baghdadi and Matuk within 10 days of the shooting, when they were among a number of Libyans deported from Britain. As a result, these potentially key figures were not questioned and are now beyond the reach of the UK legal system. This report shows that day Matuk and Baghdadi were key players, but these two people who could be charged for, for the conspiracy behind the murder are living a life of relative freedom in, in Libya. So could action ever be taken to pursue them? The answer may lie in the tangled relationship between Britain and Libya, a relationship that's promised great wealth for Britain, but is nearly always fraught and controversial. The Libyan government uh, and the way it conducts itself is totally different from what we perceive to be normal here in the United Kingdom. There is a huge internal repression and a funding for every, almost every, known terrorist organization around the world. A report commissioned for the Crown Prosecution Service suggests that there may be sufficient evidence to charge two Libyans, Mohammed Matuk and Abdul Ghadir Baghdadi, with conspiring to murder Yvonne Fletcher but there appears to be little prospect of either man ever being prosecuted for their alleged involvement. To Yvonne Fletcher's friends, this lack of progress 
amounts to a betrayal of justice. I'm very angry. I'm very angry with the government. I'm very angry with these trade deals. I'm very angry with the politicians. I'm very angry with the empty promises. The difficulties surrounding the case have been exacerbated by the strained and often hostile relationship between Libya and the UK. I think they say men are from Venus, women are from Mars. Well, I think it must be, you know, Britain is from Venus, Libya is from Mars. I mean, it, it, it is a totally different sort of uh, scenario. Libya spent much of the 1980s agitating and threatening the West by arming and encouraging terrorists. Libya became the prime suspect in the worst terrorist atrocity ever to strike Britain, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103, which killed 270 people. I've seen a big streak of light, and then there's a big explosion. Well, we can't see Lockerbie for the house, but to hear a bit just massive light. The incident would cast a long shadow over the Fletcher investigation. The, the bombing over Lockerbie um, kicked off a long period of isolation for Libya. Libya became the real pariah state. And you had, um, th th there was a ratcheting up of UN sanctions against the country because they refused to give up the people who the West thought were behind the, the Lockerbie bombing. Libya's isolation meant there was little prospect of the Metropolitan Police pursuing those responsible for Yvonne Fletcher's murder. The suspects and eyewitnesses they desperately wanted to interview were well beyond their reach. It would be another 11 years before Gaddafi decided to come in from the cold and show Libya was willing to engage with the West again. In a gesture that symbolized this re-engagement, Libya surrendered the Lockerbie suspects to an international court. Then came a moment that gave hope to all those campaigning for justice for Yvonne Fletcher. Libya accepts general responsibility for the actions of those in the Libyan People's Bureau at the time of the shooting. They express deep regret to the family of WPC Fletcher for what occurred and offer to pay compensation now to the family. Libya paid £250,000 in compensation to the Fletcher family. The carefully worded acceptance of responsibility was a milestone in the campaign to get justice. But even more significant was the decision to cooperate in a joint investigation. As a result, three years later, Metropolitan Police officers travelled to Libya for the first time. Very hopeful at that point, yes. Prior to that, we had a, a pretty closed country where it was very difficult to get any sort of access at all. Uh, to have the doors open to British police officers going there and carrying out some sort of investigation in the country uh, was very hopeful indeed. <laughs> Gradually, relations between the two countries normalised to such an extent that in 2004, the British Prime Minister Tony Blair paid a state visit to meet Colonel Gaddafi. The Libyan leader was no longer a pariah, but a partner. Who would have believed it? Libya and Britain, Gaddafi and Blair, shoulder to shoulder in the war on terror. Watching the back slapping in the tent brought great encouragement to the man who was standing just feet away from Yvonne Fletcher when she was shot. I was ecstatic. I, I really couldn't believe it. This was a breakthrough we'd been looking for. It, it, it had taken 20 odd years for a British Prime Minister to meet the Libyan head of state and, and ask for this invest investigation to go ahead, for someone to be arrested, for someone to face a court. At last this had happened. <laughs> But despite the apparent warmth between Britain and Libya, little progress was made in the investigation. The police only made three trips to Libya between 1999 and mid-2006, and they were unable to interview any eyewitnesses or suspects. There was real friction underlying all of this Metropolitan Police investigations. The, the Libyans were happy for the police to try and find the killer of Von Fletcher, but they were concerned about how it would end up, where would they be tried, in London, Tripoli, or a third country, and who would the judge be? It wasn't clear, and that would have been a concern. In a climb down to try and speed up the process, Britain agreed that any trial of suspects would take place in Libya, a bitter blow to those campaigning for justice for Yvon Fletcher. I have to say it left me cold because you cannot secure British justice in the Libyan court. It's an impossibility, no matter how you try to spin it. Ju British justice can only be served in the British court. 
And <clears throat> for us to have gone to all that length, ultimately, to secure the um, accused, for that person to then be trialed uh, in Libya for a crime that occurred in St. James's Square uh, against a British officer would, in my be, be, view, be totally futile and highly embarrassing yet again for the United Kingdom. Then, on the eve of another Prime Ministerial visit to Libya, the Crown Prosecution Service commissioned a secret report into the murder of Yvonne Fletcher. It concluded that Baghdadi and Matuk could be prosecuted for conspiracy to murder. We only know of the report's existence thanks to a leak to the Daily Telegraph two years later. This report showed for the first time in clear detail how the British government had enough evidence to try and persuade Libya to allow us to charge people over the killing of Yvonne Fletcher, but nothing happened. It laid out 25 years of a police investigation in clear as daylight detail of what the evidence was, and yet the timeline showed that when they had the opportunity, our politicians muffed it. The government told us that they are not aware that the report has ever been seen by them or the previous administration. But the investigation into Yvonne Fletcher's murder did not appear to progress after the meeting. However, the normalizing of relations did allow trade deals to be struck. On the same day Blair and Gaddafi met, BP signed a £450 million oil deal with Libya. There's no doubt about it. Trade is Trump justice. Oil is more expensive than blood. We have given up the life of a police officer for a few barrels of oil. Her killer at the moment is free. We are doing a lot of trade with Libya, a country that is harboring a police killer. That to me is outrageous and completely against the principles of any civilized country. The Foreign Office insists that they have never linked commercial considerations to the Fletcher case. But in the United States, Congress senators are currently investigating whether such oil deals influenced the release of this man. The release of Lockerbie bomber Abdul Basit Ali Al Magrahi, who was suffering from terminal cancer on compassionate grounds, was widely condemned. There was a hero's welcome for the man convicted of killing 270 people. The Scottish government firmly denies that oil deals played any part in his release. But Al Magrahi's return immediately raised hopes that perhaps a deal could be done that would assist the investigation into Yvonne Fletcher's murder. For those close to Yvonne Fletcher, it was a huge opportunity. There's a chance here for El Magrahi to go back to Libya and in return Britain received people who could be charged for the killing of Yvonne Fletcher, possibly in a third country. But Baghdadi and Matuk are no ordinary citizens of Libya. They are close confidants of Colonel Gaddafi who have thrived under his patronage. They are the inner circle of Gaddafi. They have been handpicked by Gaddafi 30 years ago, they have been groomed by him, they have been indoctrinated by him. So it's, it's a relationship between, if you like, uh, a, an absolute leader and his followers or a teacher and students. They look to him as, as, as the leader, as the mentor, as the inspiration. That's, they get all their orders from him, all directives from him, and they deal, most of them, they deal with him directly. The Metropolitan Police say they're committed to identifying those responsible for killing Yvonne Fletcher and officers visited Libya in August this year. But they will neither confirm nor deny whether they have ever interviewed Baghdadi or Matuk. Today they have key jobs in the administration of Libya. Baghdadi is in charge of the revolutionary committees and Matuk is the Minister of Public Administration. Their elevated status sickens the union of rank-and-file police officers. The fact that you have two men who are at liberty in Libya uh, who should be facing trial in this country for their actions and involvement in the murder uh, is something that hurts us. The fact that they have led a very good life uh, are now government ministers and are leading a, an exceptionally good life, I would imagine, in Libya hurts even more because the families of Yvonne Fletcher are not leading a great life. They're still suffering. You know that, I know that, and a lot of police officers are still deeply hurt by what's happened to one of their colleagues. 
there is injustice there and it needs to be righted. So just what are the prospects of either of these two men ever facing trial? The Foreign Office insists it is committed to the investigation and raises the case with the Libyan government at every possible opportunity. But to get Matuk and Baghdadi into court would require Colonel Gaddafi to hand over two of his closest acolytes. I do hold out some hope, but I think that the pressures against it will be very great, very great. Um, one of the difficulties about reform in Libya or in any country more generally is that if you talk about reform, you talk about some kind of putting right the wrongs that were done in the past, that implies that people who were guilty of crimes in the past are going to be punished. Well, you can't expect them to be very enthusiastic about that. They'll be moving heaven and earth to make sure it doesn't happen. But surely a young woman who was murdered in her prime whilst doing the job she loved deserves better than this. For those close to Yvonne Fletcher, the best way to honour her memory would be for someone to be brought to justice. <laughs>